Hello, I'm Maurice, and I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of Motherwell Cheshire. Um, following on from our Women's Days and continuing the theme of Women of Words, um, I'd like to welcome today's speaking Jade Beckles. Um, Jade is the owner of an anti-racism educational consultancy business, Inspire Noir. She's an anti-racism activist, a DEI enthusiast and founder and chairperson of the Black Women's of Cheshire Association. So welcome. If you've got any questions, then feel free to put them in the comments and we'll get back to them in the end. Over to you, Jade. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, as said, my name is Jade Beckles. I am an anti-racism activist, owner of Inspire Noir, founder and committee member of the Black Moms of Cheshire Facebook group. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about misogynoir, the space where sexism meets racism and is reserved for and unique, uniquely detrimental to Black women. So I hope you can see my presentation uh, at the same time. There we go. As I appear here before you all at this Women on Words Women's Day event, I will be so bold as to say that I feel mainstream feminism actively ignores the plight of the black woman. So let's get into it. In 1851, an enslaved woman named Sojourner Truth performed her very powerful speech entitled, Ain't I a Woman? Which spoke of the very different treatment between black and white women and how the feminist movement sweeping through that time didn't include her. What she was talking about was misogynoir. And here I am, 2022, 170 years later, complaining of the same concept and not for the first time. Misogynoir has been spoken about by many high profile feminists over the years. Dr. Shola Moshog Bamimu, Kalechi Okofo, Francoise Verges, the author of A Decolonial Feminism, actor Viola Davis, and even Maya Angelou herself. And so where I am ever required to choose between anti-racism and feminism, I choose anti-racism, but ain't I a woman too? So what does misogynoir look like? In a world where white women are told you must be pretty to be valued, black women are told we must look like you. So we may relax our hair straight, contour our noses. He said, no likey, no lighty, but we see the very obvious, no lighty, no likey. So we try to whiten the color from our woman of, but somehow we're never quite right enough, never quite light enough. Our bodies are over-sexualized and objectified. Big bums, full of fives and even full of lips. Black bodies are suddenly beautiful, just not on black bodies. European beauty standards telling our children they're ugly. Love Island telling our young women they are undesirable by all men, only lovable if fetishized. Our culture and heritage is stolen and placed on a marketplace for black fishers to profit from without paying the full price, the price that black women have to pay for being black. We don't have the privilege of being able to wipe away our blackness when it's inconvenient. And on top, ain't I a woman too? Misogynoir has life-changing and fatal consequences. Black women are up to four times more likely to die during pregnancy and childbirth here in the UK. COVID killed black women up to 4.3 times more than white men and women. Cancer in black women is more advanced at discovery and then mortality rates are higher amongst black women. This isn't due to our bodies, this is due to systemic racism. 
And I'm trying to find a circumstance that threatens to kill white women multiple times the rate of any other demographic. But I stop myself because ain't I a woman too? The heartbreaking murder of Sarah Everard brought well needed attention to the violence women suffer at the hands of men here in the UK. But it took the equally vicious murders of women of colour, such as Sabina Nessa and sisters Nicole Smallman and Biba Henry, to see the disparities in police response, social media interaction and media attention. Young black girls are missing and sexually brutalized at much higher rates, yet missing white woman syndrome keeps the attention pointed firmly in the right direction, in the white direction. We are black, we are women, we are going missing and we're dying. Do you not know that or do you not care? Because ain't I a woman too? Hashtag say her name. At this point, I would want to talk to, talk to you about child Q, but my heart still hurts. <laughs> it's still too raw and I'm still broken to tackle in detail that level of misogynoir on a black child. We live in a world where black children are not seen as children. Innocence and youth are stripped away from our children, figuratively and quite literally, because society sees black children as more adult-like, more streetwise, and less deserving of that benefit of the doubt given to white children due to their age. In 1962, Malcolm X said that the most disrespected, the most unprotected, and the most neglected person was the black woman. He was talking about massage noir. But think of those words, think on those words. The most disrespected, the most unprotected, and the most neglected. Who would ever have thought that 60 years on, we could apply those words so perfectly to child Q, a black girl child. In another 60 years, will she, will she still be asking, ain't I a woman too? The disdain the media and the public often display for black women is hurtful and harmful. Dawn Butler, Naomi Osaka, Diane Abbott, Simone Biles, Charlene White, Casta Semenya, Meghan Markle. A high profile white man can launch a full scale attack on a woman of color and was largely only challenged by anti-racism activists and other people of colour and the weatherman. Where was mainstream feminism? Our pain is shoved behind harmful stereotypes. Am I the strong black woman? Or maybe I'm the angry black woman. Nevertheless, ain't I a woman too? It is entirely possible to feel empathy for the Ukrainian people, but at the same time be furious at the so blatant show of racism in the media and at the Ukrainian and other borders deliberately refusing safe passage to people of color. Visible signs saying no blacks, pulling black people, black women, black mothers, off, train, off trains to replace them with white people. Black lives clearly not being seen as having the same value or worth saving as much as white lives. And the media so proudly reported that it was women and children first, but that was a lie. They meant white women and children first, then white men, and then the blacks. We saw black women crying, holding their hungry babies in arms, 
scared. And I can imagine sobbing, ain't I a woman too? To finish, the term misogynoir was created to provide a racialized nuance that mainstream feminism wasn't catching. Failing to recognize and include the experiences of black women, cis and trans. I wholly refuse to discuss equality within feminism unless that conversation is deep rooted in the pursuit of racial equality, lest there will be no true equality at all. That means that every feminist needs to learn the difference between not being racist and being anti-racist in order to become a meaningful ally. A recent survey by Lean in 2021 discovered that 80% of white women describe themselves as racial allies, yet only 10% of black women described their strongest allies as white. That means there's a clear disconnect between what you think you're giving and what we feel that we're receiving. Allyship has to be more than intent and empathy alone. For as long as white people believe racism is about hurt feelings that need to be empathized with in order to be a good ally, and not an entire system built on the oppression of non-white people, that allyship will always be toxic. The sad fact is that black women cannot fight misogynoir without mainstream feminism, but feminism cannot truly call itself mainstream without equality for black women because Ain't I a woman too? Thank you. And uh, at this point, I am open for any questions. Thank you, Jade. Um, any questions in the comments? Um, I can put them through to Jade as well. So please make them just put them in the chat below in the Facebook. Um, there's been a, a lot of people watching and um, Becky says sending my love. Um, and there's been some hands clapped as well and some hearts, <laughs> um, which is lovely. Um, I, um, can I just ask a question? Um, so it's in relation to your Black Mums of Cheshire. I'm just yeah. wondering more about that organization. Yeah, so we are an unincorporated association. Uh, we have a committee of six, of which I'm the chair. Um, I started uh, the Facebook group back in 2020 um, in the wake of what I call BLM 2020. Uh, out of feeling very isolated, feeling very misunderstood, uh, and not feeling that I had that support um, around what black women go through, what women of colour go through within maternity um, and raising our children. And um, we have 170 plus members strong. We have a regular coffee morning. Uh, we've run uh, Halloween parties and Christmas parties. And um, now that we have a committee, we've got some really good uh, ideas and we're really passionate about where we can go with this further basically mm -hmm. that's fantastic does it cover so um it covers all of Cheshire does it including up on the Wirral and right down is it ac across the whole of Cheshire across to Macclesfield yeah definitely I mean um no one is going to be turned away because they live in Stoke you know <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's just that I'm very, I was very mindful as well, that a lot of the support um, around being women of color and being mothers are London based. Mm -hmm. um, there's not really that much up North. Um, so of Cheshire, 
it's it's just northern based you know in the group we've got people in from manchester we do have people from sort of stafford way um yeah so anyone's welcome really oh that's lovely um i'm just having a look through and just seeing if there is any questions um <laughs> hannah is as said i was going to ask about the black mums of cheshire bmz and um, so thank you for just describing that organisation. And if anyone would like to join it or get more information, where would they go? Did you say it was on Facebook? Yes, it's a it's a Facebook group. Um, mm -hmm. They just need to search for the Black Mums of Cheshire on Facebook. Um, what I will say is that um, obviously the demographic is women of colour. Yep. Um, so it, it's, it's basically somebody who is from a um, marginalised group in regards to their ethnicity, their heritage, um, does not necessarily meet, need to be of African Caribbean. It can be um, a whole host. Uh, we have a, a lot of different ethnicities in the group. Um, but in order to maintain um, what we call a safe space, um, the demographic is in regards to marginalized groups. Um, and we do that because again, to maintain that safe space to, so that we feel comfortable when we're there. If we then opened it up to everybody, it would be a mainstream mum group and it wouldn't be a safe space anymore, so. Thank you, thank you for explaining. Um, we've had a question through from Hannah, who says, what particular challenges does rural racism place on misogynoir? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My experience, I've lived up all up and down the country. And the problem with places like Cheshire and rural areas and predominantly white areas is you can probably live your whole life and not actually interact a lot of, a lot of the time with other people of color. Maybe your neighbor once a few years ago might've been black, but when you say like, how many black people do you actually know? Um, I mean, how many, black friends do you actually have? And I mean, someone that you share secrets with, someone that you break bread with, someone you know that you love and care about, not just somebody who you worked with once. Mm. Um, and in Cheshire, there's a lot of people that have never had that interaction. Um, so there's, there's just a massive lack of knowledge. Mm. Um, and I would say ignorance, but people get upset with that word. But ignorance isn't a bad word. It means lack of knowledge. And we're all ignorant in lots of different aspects in our life. But within Cheshire, if you are a minority living in Cheshire, um, you can feel at best really misunderstood, but at worst, completely isolated, mm. completely isolated. And that's why the safe space is so important for us. Um, one of the ladies who came uh, for the first time said it felt like she'd been to therapy. Um, and that really is what, you know, the group's about. Mm -hmm. It's difficult as well because anti-racism is about completely uh, opening your mind, forgetting everything of what you felt or thought before. And that's or believed before. And that could be your entire life of being raised, you know, in one way. Um, and I'm not saying that the people of Cheshire are bad people, absolutely not. I'm born and raised in Cheshire myself, uh, and so are pretty much all of my family. Um, but when you're being asked to completely cast aside everything that you ever thought and uh, change your thinking, it can, that can be quite difficult. But when you're maybe living in a city and you've been around a lot of other um, ethnic minorities growing up, you've had exposure to that already, mm -hmm. and in Cheshire... So it can definitely feel like an uphill battle sometimes. Mm. But we've got to, we, we keep going. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I can appreciate that because just the demographics of Cheshire are unique. They may not be unique in, in, in themselves, but in terms of we have got quite a lot of big cities around us, which are more ethnically mixed, um, mm. but not, not so much some of the places in Cheshire. So... I think it, it was a really interesting question that from um, from Hannah and and thanks for answering it, Jade. Um, because Cheshire, as I say, Cheshire's demographics are different, um, but that also is different in terms of the rural split as well. Um, there are towns which, when you live in a town, it feels like you know that's your world, but then there's a lot of rural areas as well. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just asking anyone else if they've got any, um, Hannah's put great explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I'll just ask if anyone else has got any more questions as well. Um, they do just take a, a moment to come through on Facebook. Um, thank you for the way you did the presentation as well. That was really interesting with the different slides on different areas um, and the way you talked us through that. Um, I hope people got a chance to actually read what was on the presentations as well, because obviously it was quite different from what I was speaking about. Some of them were anyway. Um, and, and anyone can go back and rewatch this as well. So they can take, you know, if, if it was too much information the first time, you can go back and read through, but um, hopefully everyone can see, see them. Um, the meaningful allyship was a really useful slide for me. Um, so thank you for putting that one on um, and about and all the different points you made about spreading the word and recognizing your privilege um, and showing up in silence is complicity and words have power. And I think that, you know, it's great to have you here speaking because words do have power and it, we, you can read about it and you can talk to people and, you know, you, it's about opening your mind and, and listening as well. Um, yeah. Not just hearing, but listening. So thank you. I um, listened to a really, really fantastic podcast um, the other day. I'm just trying to find it now, uh, find the details for it. Uh, just give me a second. Uh, Dr. Yabba Blay, We Can Do Hard Things, episode 79. Um, it's on YouTube. Um, and it was uh, the reason why I bring it up is because she spoke about allyship and um, I really resonated with it because she said, instead of using the word ally, uh, we should replace it with accomplice. <laughs> and she said, um, think of it as I'm not asking you to commit crime with me. Absolutely not. But it's how it feels to have an accomplice versus how it feels to have an ally. So if I ring you, at two o'clock in the morning and say, girl, something's happened. I'm coming to pick you up. And you say, I'm up, I'm getting dressed, come for me. No questions asked. That's an accomplice. And that's the, you know, the, the feelings that we want, that we need out of allyship. Because if I ring you and I say, girl, something's happened. And you go, I'm really sorry about that. That really shouldn't happen to you. Let me know if there's anything I can do that's allyship and so it's, it's the feeling I need to know that you're in it with me you're my accomplice in this mm -hmm. not just a passive ally kind of thing um so I think that's the difference between sort of meaningful allyship and just being an ally because also in regards to being an ally um if it's if you, you dip in and dip out it can actually be quite detrimental uh, because when you dip out, I'm on my own, hmm. you know. Thank you. Um, I think that covers, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll put Tracy's comment question to you as well. Um, so when you said about supporting more than empathy, um, her question is, what can others do to help with that? It's definitely uh, the activism part. It's the doing. Um, I think the first part is knowing uh so this list on my uh on this last slide where it says subject examples all those things underneath there i really need you to go away and actually research those things and i know what they are so that i don't have to explain them to you when something happens um because that, that's exhausting mm. activism is uh anti-racism is exhausting it's exhausting for anyone and i can totally understand why um, some white people um, get burnt out and just think, oh, I can't do this and back off. But what I would say is when you do that, recognize that that's a privilege in itself because I can't do that. I don't have the benefit of doing that. Um, I can't back out and, and come back in it because it's my life. And um, so true, a true ally recognizes that and doesn't leave me on my own, you know? And if you read those things and you research those things, also don't expect your black friend to teach you about these things, go away and do the research yourself. Cause like I say, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, and become a true anti-racist. There's so much research out there and um, resources that explains and so many books, Instagram is fantastic. 
um there's lots of accounts again so on the uh presentation there was a couple of um apt markers with different accounts from instagram um a wealth of resources out there to educate people into becoming a better anti-racist and empathy is like two percent i don't need empathy i need activism thank you <laughs> um no it's great what you're saying and i'm gonna take I'm going to go back through your presentation and, <laughs> and follow those Instagrams and, and, and do some of the reading because I have read a little bit about the, the feminist and racism crossover and it, you know, it opened my mind just that little, you know, little book that I read about it. But there's so much out there, as you say, and um, mm -hmm. I think in the past, I'd say in the past 10 years in, in the, the bits that are coming to my attention and I definitely wouldn't say I'm you know, I, I, I don't see everything, um, but there's a lot more out there, I feel. There's podcasts, as you say, some podcasts are fantastic. Yeah. Um, and Instagram, that's more than just photos of people's, you know, nice flower bouquets or something. There's so much really useful information out there. So it, it, there's a lot of ways of getting that research. So thank you for highlighting some of those. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just read through some more of the comments. Um, we've had some lovely ones and um, no questions but great presentation amazing thank you um, and another one just saying that helps to answer my question thank you uh, another one not a question but huge respect and thank you for creating a safe space for others and continuing this important conversation mm -hmm. and a lovely one at the end I'm a forever ally this is a war <laughs> and I fight with you so oh, thank you. Thank it you is. It definitely comment. is um, a war. Um, and, you know, people have said in, in regards to um, the anti-blackness that we've seen um, around the Ukrainian war and people, a lot of people say, oh, even in war, there's space for racism. And I said, well, that's because racism's war. Yeah. Yes, it is. Of course, you're going to find racism in war because racism is war. It really, is a, it really is a matter of life and death because you mentioned in, in your slides about the um, the mortality rates for pregnant women and, and women giving birth um, from the black communities and, and exactly that. It is a matter of life and death for those exactly. women. Um, and there's so much more research from an institutional point of view that needs to be done, whether it be medical, you know, in the medical trials and and um, medical research and education as well. I think that's only just being recognized and you know you can't you can't quite believe it that it's it's now. But as I say, I speak from a place of privilege. So um I just really hope that everything improves across all different organizations and, and different institutions. And I think that's the thing, because a lot of people they may have heard things like you know five times more and four times more, but they just automatically assume or we heard a lot about um black people disproportionately dying of covid and they just automatically assume that it's something in our bodies mm -hmm. but it's it's not it's it's due to systemic institutionalized racism that is why there's that disproportionate mortality rates within maternity or covid or or cancer um in and and yeah it's about getting that out there and um every institution whether it be education the police health housing there is those levels of institutionalized racism um so first that's why we need as many anti-racists as possible because first you've got to know it before you can do anything about it thank you ever so much jade it's, it's been so done. good to talk to you this evening <laughs> thank um, you very much for having me <laughs> We've had no more no more questions come through, so um, I think I'll end it there. Um, and I definitely recommend that you know we all go away and and do what we can, um, and and just go back and read through these slides. It's it's fantastic work that you're doing, Jade. So thank you. And what I will say is, you know, no one's ever going to be the best anti-racist overnight. There's a lot of research, and you know. I am a lady in her 30s, so I have had 30 years of experience of this. So it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but just keep at it, you know, make it a priority and keep at it. Keep reading um, and we'll all get there. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Um, so that's 
Um, so I just want to say thank you again, Jade, for um, coming along and for supporting our um, Women's Day and um, supporting our Women's Day. Um, a quick reminder that we are a charity and although this talk was free, if you'd like to make a donation, um, we'd really appreciate it. It will go towards um, helping us support the local communities. Uh, the link to donate is going to be put in the comments, so you'll see that. Um, but thank you for watching and I hope to see some of you at our future events. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
I did say to myself, no, they want it. They want it. Yeah, so I'm just no, going we, it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. We're all about making sure women are heard. So mm. that includes black mums. It includes, it includes, it includes men as well, but definitely um, we want to hear more from you. So it's been fantastic for you to support um, our Women's Day. So 